Before the college football playoff era, the teams that were to play for a national title would be decided by the Bowl Championship Series or the BCS. As most of y'all know, this system was very flawed and created a lot of controversy throughout its time of being in place. But there are a few seasons that it had more of an impact on than these three teams in the 2004 season. USC, Oklahoma, and Auburn finished that year with an undefeated record and yet only two teams were able to compete for a national title. Of course we know that this makes sense, but what comes into question is how they selected those two teams that played in the national title and what that third team that gets left out is lacking. In this video we will go through those teams regular season and see what separated the two teams that were able to compete for a title from the one team that would be left out. So let's get into it. So if you don't already know, the two teams that played in that title game were USC and Oklahoma, with the Auburn Tigers being left to play in the Sugar Bowl that year. What makes this a hard debate is that each of these teams are pretty similar in overall talent and schedule difficulty, uh, not exactly the same but pretty similar. Along with this, these three teams were in three different conferences and did not really get a chance to play each other or each other's opponents. So with all that to take into consideration, it was very hard to choose which one of these teams to leave out of the national title, but we're gonna try and find out what the criteria was for getting into that national championship game. So this USC team was coming off a weird 2003 season, in which case there is an argument that they were the national champions that year. You see, as the 2003 regular season came to a close, the three teams that were at the top were USC, LSU, and Oklahoma, who all had one loss. Uh, however, it was USC that was ranked one in the AP poll when the regular season had ended, but when it came time for the BCS rankings to come out, they somehow ended up as number three. Now, this was a shock to a lot of people, and it's honestly one of the big reasons we've moved on to the playoff, but understandably, people were not happy with this ranking. Because of this, Oklahoma and LSU were set to play in that national championship game, even though USC was ranked ahead of them before the BCS rankings came out, uh, and LSU was given the official national championship trophy. So all that being said, some people do regard USC as the national champions that year, and that's why I say there's a case for them, uh, but nonetheless, it was still a great year for the team. However, in the 2004 season, they made sure that there would be no debate over who the true national champions were, because they dominated every opponent they played. Uh, they came into the season being ranked one in the AP poll and finished the year with that same ranking. It's honestly not a shock that this team cruised through the season the way they did because they had some absolute dogs in their backfield. The man taking the snaps, Matt Leinart, won the Heisman Trophy that year after a phenomenal season. Along with him, the duo of Reggie Bush and Lindell White just plowed through opposing defenses and they both almost reached a thousand rushing yards on the year with Reggie coming up just short. Looking at their season, there are only a select number of games that they won by a small margin, which was the week four game against an unranked Stanford where they only won by three. But that was the closest that any team would come to beating them. The next game in week five, they played their highest ranked opponent, which were the seventh ranked Cal Bears. This game had a little more meaning to it because the previous year they had actually lost to this team in triple overtime. The final score to this game, however, was 23-17, and although it was not a complete show of dominance, they still got the dub. Now, I do want to mention that USC did only play two ranked teams in the regular season, so they did not have the hardest schedule ever, but nonetheless, they were by all means deserving of the national championship that they won. Their only other kind of close game on the year was when they played UCLA and the final score was 29 to 24. At the end of the season, they faced Oklahoma in the national championship and absolutely destroyed them 55 to 19. Matt Leinar ended the year with 3,322 passing yards with 33 touchdowns and six interceptions. Like I mentioned before, this performance along with the dominant season that his team put together allowed for Matt to come home with the Heisman. Other standout performances include the two running backs I also mentioned earlier, with Lindell White who led the team in rushing, finishing with 1,103 rushing yards and 15 touchdowns, along with 11 receptions for 97 yards and an additional two receiving touchdowns. Reggie Bush had 908 rushing yards and six touchdowns, along with 43 receptions for 509 yards and an additional seven receiving touchdowns. 
So although Reggie was a little more productive in the receiving game, both of their overall production was pretty similar. In the receiving game, Matt did a pretty good job of spreading the ball around as not one receiver had 1,000 yards on the year, but the closest was Dwayne Jarrett, who ended the year with 55 receptions for 849 yards and 13 touchdowns. All in all, this was one of the most dominant college seasons we have ever seen. However, we have a couple more teams to look at, so let's move on. Like USC, this team had some dogs in the backfield. At quarterback day, Jason White, who, for how good he was, is largely forgotten. He actually won the Heisman the year before in 2003, and this year was nearly just as good. With him in the backfield was a freshman, Adrian Peterson, who decided to make his first year in college his best year. I'll mention exact stats in a little bit, but first we'll go over their season. They really had a pretty similar year to USC's in that they dominated every team they played with a slightly harder schedule than the Trojans. Their toughest game of the year came when they faced a fifth ranked Texas team led by Vince Young and the final score to that game was 12 to zero. After that, they only played two other ranked opponents which were two of their closest games. Uh, their game against 20th ranked Oklahoma State was actually their closest game of the season because they only won by three points, but that's the closest they came to losing until, of course, the national championship game. USC proved to just be too much for them, and like I mentioned earlier, they got demolished in that game. Standout performances on the year came from the two guys I also mentioned earlier, which were Jason White and Adrian Peterson. Jason White ended the year with 3,205 passing yards with 35 touchdowns and nine interceptions. This performance allowed for him to finish third in the Heisman voting that year, and it was all around a pretty great year for him and his team. Like Jason White, Adrian Peterson also had a great year. In fact, I'd say it was damn near incredible. Bro finished the season with 1,925 rushing yards and 15 touchdowns. And remember that he was a true freshman that year, which makes this season even more impressive. Another thing that these two teams have in common is that they both started and ended the season with the same ranking, which means that they performed exactly how everyone expected them to perform. But with that, we will move on to our final team that outperformed almost all expectations. Alright, so now that we have covered those two teams, we will end with probably the most controversial season, uh, which belongs to the 2004 Auburn Tigers. I purposely left this team for last just because the story of their season is the most complicated. The story of their 2004 season actually begins in the 2003 season with an event known as Jetgate. I'll try to keep it brief, but this story is kind of necessary in order to give context for the 2004 season. Basically, the 2003 season for the Tigers was supposed to be a great year for them. There were a couple of national publications that picked them to win the national championship, and they were ranked sixth in the preseason polls. They had a stacked defense, and the expectations for this team were very high going into the 2003 season. Uh, but there was a slight problem, which was that Bobby Petrino had left the team after one season as the offensive coordinator to go be the head coach at Louisville. Even though Bobby had left, head coach Tommy Tuberville had decided that he still wanted to run Petrino's offense. But the thing about this offense is that it was unique and complicated. So the problem wasn't exactly running and calling the plays that Petrino had put in place the year before, it was dealing with problems within the offense when things went wrong. The guys that had taken over for Petrino didn't know how it really worked and what set up what, so when things went wrong, they had no idea how to fix it. And that was the main reason that the Tigers were not able to meet expectations for the 2003 season. But there was a bigger story that went on during the year as well. As the Tigers dropped the first two games of the season, with the second being against an unranked Georgia Tech, Auburn's president William Walker had decided that changes should be made. The change he wanted was to get rid of Tommy Tuberville and call Bobby Petrino back to take over as head coach for the Tigers. As the season continued, William Walker gained allies on the board of trustees, and together they made the decision to fire Tommy Tuberville after the Iron Bowl. Fast forward to the Thursday before the Iron Bowl, Walker and a couple of his colleagues took a flight to an airport near Louisville to talk to Petrino, who had lied to Louisville about his interest in Auburn. Uh, but they flew to an airport near Louisville to basically close the deal. 
Walker had also not followed protocol by alerting Louisville about talking to Petrino. So we have two parties here, one going behind the back of Louisville and the other going behind the back of Tommy Tuberville. Now I do want to make it clear that Tommy was aware that he was most likely going to get fired after the Iron Bowl. Keyword, after the Iron Bowl. But the reason William Walker wanted to close the deal with Petrino before the Iron Bowl was because he planned to go on vacation the next week for Thanksgiving. Uh, when the Iron Bowl came, Auburn ended up pulling off a victory against Alabama, but still, Tommy was expecting to get fired. This was going to happen until the trip to that airport to talk to Petrino behind Tommy's back was exposed to the public. As you would imagine, William Walker and his colleagues experienced a lot of backlash for this. The news that the trip had been exposed found William Walker while he was on vacation and he was forced to deal with what became a bizarre situation. After a lot of fans lobbied for Tommy Tuberville, William Walker eventually asked him if he would stay and although he was hurt, he agreed. The two colleagues that Walker had gone to the airport with ended up getting pushed out of their jobs and the whole situation was a big mess for William Walker and the board of trustees. So I tell that story because I think it gives good context for what was on everyone's mind going into the next season. With all of that being said, let's get into the Tigers 2004 season. Out of the two teams we have covered thus far, this team definitely has the best case of deserving a shot at a national championship. They had a harder schedule than USC and Oklahoma as they played three top 10 opponents in the regular season. Like USC and Oklahoma, the identity of this team was its offense and more specifically the running back duo of Cadillac Williams and Ronnie Brown. Along with them, Jason Campbell was a big contributor to the team and we will look at their numbers after we see how the season went. They were ranked 17th in the preseason rankings and they absolutely outdid any expectations that people had for this team. Their first huge win of the season came in week three when they beat fifth ranked LSU by one point. That win gave them a boost in the rankings as they made their way into the top 10. Along with that, it also gave them a realization that this team was special. In week five, they got another big win over 10th ranked Tennessee. Not only a win, but a pretty convincing one at that. Auburn was ranked 8th going into the game, so it was supposed to be a competitive, hard-fought game, and Auburn came out and pretty much cruised to a win. The last ranked team that they played in the regular season was against an 8th ranked Georgia team, and they beat them 24-6. They then capped off the regular season with a 38-28 victory over Tennessee in the SEC Championship game. However, even though they were SEC champions, they were not exactly focused on that because they were aware that their efforts would not be able to result in a national championship. Essentially, what it came down to when deciding who would get a bid to play in that national championship that year was the team's out-of-conference games. Their three out-of-conference games that year featured Louisiana Monroe, Louisiana Tech, and the Citadel. These three opponents were easier out-of-conference games than USC and Oklahoma, and apparently that held a lot of weight in the decision-making process. With this in mind, although Auburn had the easier out-of-conference games, they also beat more top 15 teams during the regular season than USC and Oklahoma combined. So at least to me, I feel that that should have held more weight in the decision, but it didn't. I'm not at all sure why the out-of-conference games held as much weight as they did, but that was the reality for the situation. So looking at this situation, I, like many other people, feel that Auburn got snubbed out of a national championship appearance. We will never know if they could have captured that title because that USC team was extremely good, but the line between Auburn and Oklahoma was super thin, so it's just really unfortunate that only one of those teams was able to compete for a title. They finished the season with a three-point win over Virginia Tech in the Sugar Bowl, and with that win, they had captured the undefeated season. Looking at standout performances on the year, Cadillac Williams finished the season with 1,165 rushing yards and 12 rushing touchdowns. He added to that with 21 receptions for 152 receiving yards 
and one additional receiving touchdown. Ronnie Brown came just short of 1,000 rushing yards as he ended the season with 913 and eight rushing touchdowns, but added to that with a pretty productive receiving performance as he hauled in 34 catches for 313 yards and a receiving touchdown. So both running backs ended the year with over 1,000 yards from scrimmage and had a very productive season. Jason Campbell ended the year with 2,700 passing yards with 20 touchdowns and 7 interceptions. The leading receiver on the team was Courtney Taylor, who had 43 catches for 737 yards and 6 touchdowns. This Auburn team was extremely talented, and like I said, it's just a shame that we never got to see them get a shot at a national championship. So as we take a look at these three seasons, the one conclusion that I feel is worth mentioning is that I am very thankful that we are no longer in the BCS era. Had the playoff been in place for the 2004 season, it would have been some of the best games we would have ever seen. It's unfortunate that it took so long for the playoff to be put into place because it was well known that the bowl championship series was extremely flawed. The 2004 season sure isn't the only year that teams got screwed by the BCS, but I feel that it is one of the most interesting. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty certain that there has never been another time when a team in the SEC West went undefeated on the year and did not even get a chance to capture a national title. I don't think it's anyone's fault per se, because if you remember, Oklahoma was also undefeated besides that national championship game, so they would have had just as good of an argument if Auburn had gotten that bid to play in the game. So if there is anything to blame, it's the fact that the bowl championship series was in place. I think that this year was fun to look back on, and honestly, it just makes me appreciate the playoffs in today's college football. With the 12-team playoff coming in the 2024 season, we are moving into a time when no team that has a remote shot at a national championship will be left out of the picture. Alright guys, that's gonna do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, please like and share the video, as that helps the channel to grow. Besides that, until next time.